Welcome. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, welcome to all of you who are online. We are continuing our sermon series called Renewed, A Journey Through Romans 12. And it is in a pursuit of an authentic relationship with Jesus. So I want to just take a, a few moments and rehearse what we have learned so far. Because of the amazing mercies of God given to us in Jesus Christ, Paul is urging us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, to sin surrender ourselves, and he argues that this is our reasonable service to God because of all the gifts that he has given to us. Having our minds transformed through the gospel of Christ enables us to discern and to do the will of God. Thinking rightly about ourselves in humility opens our understanding to better know God, to better know and understand ourselves, and to know others as we are known by God. And this addresses a basic human need of identity. Being unified in the body of Christ with other believers satisfies our innate longing to belong, to be accepted, and to be truly known. This meets a basic human need for security. And then discovering and employing our unique God-given gifts gives our lives meaning, value, and purpose in the world, which addresses a basic need for significance. And so then the question is why? Why has God done all of this? And why has he created us in this way? Because love. We just watched a, a video of a baptism. And what a beautiful thing that is when, when people give their lives to the Lord and say, I trust God and I'm trusting him for the rest of my life. God has done something in my life that uh, has, has led me into a, 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 new, a new understanding of God's love for me, of forgiveness for my sins, and it makes me want to love him and follow him forever. And so last week, uh, Christopher and Crystal got baptized, and we left the baptistry uh, up because in case anyone else would like to get baptized. And so if you haven't been, it's not just recommended, it's, it's one of the fundamental things of our faith. When Jesus sent his disciples out to preach the kingdom of God, he says, repent towards God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of sin. So it's central to our faith. And, and, and I, I am concerned that, you know, some of us place too little value on baptism and, or maybe there's other reasons that prevent us from going through that step, but it's, it's instrumental. It doesn't, it doesn't save us, but uh, it can leave our lives kind of stuck, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more of that later. And so we're hoping to see a lot more baptisms in the times ahead. So I don't know if any of you uh, remember back in the 70s and early 80s, and Hector, I don't know if they still do this, but when you're watching a football game, you know, the cameras would pan the audience, and, and sometimes there would be this guy with a big sign that says, John 316. Do they still do that? Okay, so I don't know because, unfortunately, I, I don't watch a lot of football these days. Sorry, Hector. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a subtle form of evangelism. Uh, it kind of presumes that either somebody already knows what John 316 refers to, or maybe it will stir enough curiosity to search it out. And, and that's what happened to me. Um, I actually had a, a, a bit of a, a, a Christian upbringing in my younger years, and then I went away from the Lord for about 10 years and, you know, was hanging out with people uh, and, and doing things I probably shouldn't have been doing. Um, and so I remember one day I was sitting with some of my buddies and we were watching a football game and, and uh, this, the 
camera actually focused on the guy holding the sign, and it just stayed there for a moment. And my, my two buddies uh, responded like, well, what is this about? This guy's at every game, you know? And, and so, you know, and because I had previously been curious about it, I, I had to go back and look it up. What is that, you know? And, and so when they asked that question, I responded, oh, that's, that's a scripture from the Bible. It, uh, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should, should not perish but have everlasting life. And my two buddies looked at me and just went, where did that come from? And, and how do you know that, right? Yeah. And so, but it was, you know, before, that was before I began living for Christ and I was still firmly entrenched in a worldly lifestyle of sin. But that was the beginning, that was the early days of God working in my life. But God so loved because love. God's greatest demonstration of love is sending Jesus to the earth to die for our sins and to show us the heart of the Father. I'm going to share a couple more scriptures, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He redeems us just as we are, sinners. 1 John 4, 10. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So that's a big word. Propitiation means an atoning sacrifice, something that atones for a wrong done, one which regains favor and goodwill. And so Jesus' death on the cross regained favor and goodwill of God towards us. And we've regained favor and goodwill with God because of what God did, because of what Jesus did, nothing about what we did. And so if if you have faith in Christ, you don't need to wonder about whether you have God's favor. That's all inherent in what God has done for us. And, and so many of us live under this, this cloud of guilt and shame, and we carry it around with us. And, and what that really just shows is that we, we don't have a complete understanding of, of the gospel yet right? God has taken care of that. And so when we can switch from this presumption of, you know, disfavor and, and kind of step over into a, a new reality or an assumption of living that we are blessed of God, Amen. that God favors us, that changes everything. It changes everything. And so I want to just encourage you, and I'm speaking that out of my own personal experience. I lived under that for so, so many years. And it seems so, so trivial. You mean all we have to do is change our thinking? <laughs> yeah, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? It, 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 it seems so simple. It can't be that simple, but it is. We dwell under that cloud that, that Satan puts on us or that we have put on ourselves. And when we choose to believe by faith, it, it's, it's like, you know, just, just stepping out under the sunshine, right? And, and when, you, when you wake up every day and you presume God's goodness, his favor in your life, everything changes. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Initiative and response. God took the initiative. And all of life, all of our Christian walk now is learning to return a response of love to God. A response of love that, that deepens as our trust in him deepens. And as we grow in maturity of Christ, we, um, Ignatius talks about, you know, our goal is really to, to 
learn to more readily give a return of love to God. In the result, we become more loving persons. That's it. I think that's a great summary. That's what the gospel is about. God took us out of our darkness and our fears and our sin, and he's moving us into the light of what it means to be a son, a daughter, a child of God. To walk in the knowledge of his love and to return a response of love more readily. To be, to become more loving persons. So our title of the sermon today is Affection in Action. And we'll be looking at Romans 12, 5 through, or 9 through 15. And so let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we just choose to rest our hearts and minds in your presence, to receive your love, to bask in your love, to become immersed in your love to the desire that we will become more loving persons so that you can love through us just as Jesus showed us the heart of the Father as we learn to love and walk in that obedience to your truth I pray our lives demonstrate to others the goodness of God and your love which culminated in the cross of Christ in our own resurrection to life and so I just want to speak life into each one of us today in Jesus name amen so because love What's your definition of love? And no doubt your definition of love, like mine, has been colored by a very imperfect experience of love. No human being on the face of the earth fully understands the fullness of God's love, with the only exception being Jesus Christ. And he lived it for us as a witness for us to look at and and to learn from and to be drawn towards that love. So there's, you know, different ideas about love. The, the, an immature idea of love that we all have, you know, in our, <laughs> in our early years is, is one that is more based on attraction, you know, and those butterflies we get when, when you know, something clicks and, you know, with another person. And, and, um, and that's kind of the world's view of love. And, and so when people enter into a relationship or a marriage with that, a lot of times they don't always go so well. They don't always end so well because love is not just the feeling or the attraction because those wane. Those, uh, and so, um, do you remember that there was a, a 1970s show called The Love Boat? Anybody remember <laughs> The Love Boat? And it was, a, it was a cruise ship and there was Captain Steubing and there would always be some kind of, you know, uh, romantic thing that was going on. And I remember watching it one time and there was, uh, Captain Steubing was, was actually doing a wedding on board the ship. And um, you, you remember the, the vows that are, the traditional vows is that do you promise to love, honor, and cherish one another as long as you both shall live, right? Uh, but I noticed, and I was, a, I guess, a, a teen, maybe late teen at that time, but I noticed that Cha- uh, Captain Steubing changed one word. And, w- and so what he said, he says, do you promise to love, honor, and cherish one another as long as you both shall love? Right? And it, so what does that mean? It means when the feelings wane, move on. Find the next person to love right? Even at that young age, and I wasn't walking with God then, I, I somehow uh, intrinsically knew there's something wrong with that. That doesn't work. And then in Christian circles, I often hear, you know, love isn't a feeling, 
it's a commitment and and there certainly is truth to that and sometimes it's only our commitment that keeps us going and and you know just an example from my own life my wife and i both came from you know dysfunctional backgrounds and not knowing it you know uh, we got we met here at this church uh we've been married 33 years and we when we got together we were both christians and so we both sort of told ourselves this is going to be great you know we're christians we're going to uh do it right and we're going to raise a christian family right what, what could be better and but it wasn't very long after we said i do that we started to realize that we got some baggage and, and I got to tell you, we went through a lot of years that were very, very difficult. And during those times, it was only our love of God and our fear of God, I think, that kept us together. Amen. You know, there, there, was there any affection? It was gone, right? It was like, you know, and, and you, know, you, you might even think, okay, Lord, uh, I'm doing this for you. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and she might have thought, and I might have thought, you know, I don't love her. I mean, I don't like her, but I love her, right? That's love without affection. I'm going to do this because I know it's the right thing to do, but I don't feel it in my bones. And there was a time where, where both of us realized, okay, this, this, this isn't working. And so we, in, in our little, small faith, you know, we had to start praying, or I started praying, Lord, we need you to restore affection. Remind us why we're together. You know, and it took time, and we had to go through some severe ups and downs. But, you know what, I want to tell you now that we just celebrated 33 years, and today, Jeannie and I are enjoying the love relationship that we always desired we always wanted we always imagined and i'm realizing now that when we got married we didn't have the tools we were far too broken right god had to take us through stuff and break us down and and you know shed you know all the stuff that was getting in the way and so it is it is possible not possible in God, in God, God does it. You know, um, <laughs> I'll just say this, a, a, a joke, that I guess, that Jeannie and I used to say, maybe it was a coping mechanism, but we used to joke with each other, you know, divorce is not an option. Murder? Maybe. <laughs> Don't push me. I heard someone else say recently that love is a skill that must be practiced and cultivated. And there's probably truth in that, too. We learn things that, that uh, help us. But ultimately, love is surrendering to a divine call to care for others in a way that is, that is greater than our capacity. I'll say that one more time. Love is surrendering to a divine call to care for others in a way that is greater than our capacity. So Jesus said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And so, make no mistake, the kind of love with which we are called to love one another is nothing short of a supernatural love. It is beyond us. In order to lay down our lives for others, to serve sacrificially, to forgive, to overlook offenses, to bless our persecutors, and to do good to those that harm you requires an infusion of supernatural love, as well as hope in a future kingdom, right? That's what we call divine gratification, I'm sorry, deferred gratification on a godlike scale. Deferred gratification. I'm going to choose to love in this life, though, though I lose my life in, in this life, knowing that I 
we'll have a better resurrection. The church in the world is the place where we begin to experience and grow through dying daily to know and express the love of God in Christ Jesus. And nothing expresses love like dying so someone else can live. So the, the passages we're going to look at today are Romans 9a, uh, verse, verses 9a, 10, 11, I mean, 13, and 15. And those are sort of cherry-picked out as, as ones that, that uh, obviously pertain to love and how we love each other. Um, but I always like to look at verses in their context, so I'm going to, uh, well, I'll read this first. Let love be genuine. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so now I'd like to show it to you in the context of the other verses that surround it. I used to think that these verses were a series of random, unrelated commands, but I, I've come to believe that these are more related than they appear. And so I'm just going to go through it and comment as, as we go. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. For love to be genuine, it must abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. To hold fast to what is good, we dare not allow ourselves to become complacent or lazy concerning the commands to love one another as Christ loves us in our service of God. Loving one another is our service to God. You cannot say that you are serving God and not love others. He goes on, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Now, why does it say rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer? Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Jesus came to redeem the persecutors as well as the persecuted. Paul demonstrates pure love by leading his Roman guards, um, captors, to faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, I'll just throw this out there, that his Roman captors did not release Jesus from prison just because they became followers of Jesus. They still did their job, they obeyed their senior officers, and eventually Paul was handed over to be executed. So I'm not telling you what to think about this, but you might have to wrestle with that reality. But what I do know is that Paul was able to love his enemies because his focus was not on his own personal injustice or mistreatment at the hands of others, but on the reality of an eternal kingdom. Again, deferred gratification. Love transcends and triumphs over all the injustices of life. God is judge, and he will sort things out. We're not the final judges. Okay, so here is an example of two verses that don't appear to be related, but I, I believe they are. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. We might like to think that we are to 
rejoice and, and to weep with fellow believers and family and friends. But part of loving your enemies in, is genuinely caring about them and what is happening in their lives. Can you genuinely be glad when your enemy experiences good fortune? Ask yourself that. That's kind of tough. Can you genuinely grieve with them when they fall on misfortune? You see, love is starting to call on you for something greater than your own capacity. First John 4, 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Amen. And so what do, you, what do we learn from this? God is the source of all love. We have been born of God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are called to love. When we make our bodies a living sacrifice to love others, God is expressing his love through us, to, to the world through us, just like he did Jesus. And sometimes that requires a sacrificial act on our part to love those who are unloving. Failure to love demonstrates that we do not really know God. That hurts. God is love. So what I like to do for, uh, right now is just take a 30 seconds and let's meditate on that for a moment, that God is love. Seriously, just uh, I'm gonna, let's be silent for 30 seconds. And what is that saying? What is it speaking to your heart, to your soul? Or what is the Spirit of God speaking to your spirit? If you're like me, you experience a, a mixture of thoughts, of feelings, of questions, internal conflict, or maybe some conviction. For me, it makes me realize how much in my life I have not truly understood God. My behavior often shows how ungodlike I am. So <clears throat> this week I was kind of stressed out. And just feeling like there were too many things on my plate. And I, I had, you know, several big things that I was getting ready for and um, a lot of interruptions, a lot of things that were inserting, you know, into my days. And, and, and I would, I would, my stress was starting to, to mount up. And then, you know, I was, uh, <laughs> one day I was, uh, I came in just to spend a few casual moments with, with Jeannie before getting busy again. And, and, um, you know, that was on my mind. That was my expectation. Um, but then she had some concerns on her mind, and so she started laying out some of those uh, concerns, which I perceived as adding more things on my plate that, that I couldn't handle. And so then I sort of lost it and, and lost my temper and, and got upset. And to Jeannie's credit, um, you know, she recognized my stress and... She redirected my attention and our attention to meditate on God's peace. She actually played a, a devotional, and, um, and, you know, it turned out that, that the devotion that she prayed was exactly, exactly what I needed. And then shortly after that, I, I went back to work, and, and then I received a text message from Michelle Crow, who is currently vacationing in Hawaii, and she said, hey, I was just thinking about you, and, 
And um, I, there was this little devotion that I had, and I just w wanted you to read it. And so, you know, I read it, and, and again, it wasn't, you know, it was exactly, you know, what I needed to hear in that moment. And then, you know, several times I'll say that, um, that Kayla, Kayla Duke, sent me uh, text message prayers throughout the week. And so, so Jeannie and, and Kayla and Michelle oversee our, our prayer ministry. And so, so Jeannie and Michelle and Kayla, each one, independent of the other, used their God-given gifts to ministry, minister to me at, at a time where I just needed that word of en encouragement or to be, you know, re-centered in, you know, the trust of God and, and that kind of, and so there's a perfect example of the body of Christ at work, you know, among us. How might our lives change if we fully realize the implications that God is love? So, um, throughout this series, we've been referring to Chip Ingram's book, True Spirituality, and during this section that we're looking at today, uh, you know, nine, 9 through 14 or 15 or so, um, Chip identifies 13 commands, and he identifies them in the context of what our relationships should look like. What are life-giving relationships, right? So it's not just commands that each of us try to do and perfect in ourselves. They're all commands that, that help us to live in harmony and in unity with one another. They're, they're all important. And so um, we're going to, I'm going to, I have three slides for the 13 commands, and we're going to look at them, but then do a little bit of an exercise. And so um, I'm going to come back and we'll go through them a second time. And so I just want to give you a heads up that as we go through them, B, I want you to identify where are those areas that you feel like you're, are strengths of yours. You know, you're, you're pretty good at that. Maybe just one or two. But then also identify one or two areas where maybe you're weak, you have weaknesses. You need to grow, okay? So I'm going to go through the first time fairly quickly, and then we'll go back a second time. Authenticity. Stop hiding. Are you able to be real and vulnerable? Second one, don't be a hypocrite. Live in truth. Sometimes we can, you know, have two faces. We, we you know, have what we say and how we act, and then we have what we really think, right? Third one is practice purity. Fourth one is actually care to love, but not just by duty, but love with affection. The fifth one is seek community. Don't be isolated. Don't be alone. Purposely gather with other believers. The next one is lift one, other, one another up. Show honor. Lay down your life just as Jesus laid down his life for us. Spiritual zeal. Don't be spiritually lazy. Are you just going through the motions? Or, or are you excited about following God and, and looking forward to what uh, the, the work and, and calling that he has on your life? Diligently serve others. Patiently persevere with hope and prayer. Are you prone to discouragement towards wanting to, to quit sometimes? Be generous to meet needs. Be hospitable. Bless everyone without anger. Okay, so earlier on we shared that this whole chapter, Romans 12, really speaks of five core relationships. The first one is our relationship with God. The second one is our, the, our relationship within a corrupt world system. Our relationship with ourselves. Are we living in integrity and, 
and honesty with ourselves. Our relationship with other believers, that is the church, and our relationship with people who persecute you or are your enemies. So these 13 commands that we have just gone through instruct us in how to live within these five relationships. There's probably more commands than that if you take in the whole chapter. But, and I want to notice uh, that Chip differentiates, Chip Ingram in his book, differentiates between our relationship with a, within a corrupt world system and our relationship with people who persecute you. We don't treat those the same, right? We are to expose evil. Well, that's exposing evil within the corrupt world system. But Paul reminds us, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Those who persecute are themselves captives of our adversary, the devil. And we wage war on their behalf as well. Romans 12, 3, remember this? I say to every one of you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. And so, when we think of these 13 commands, how would you assess yourself soberly regarding how you're doing with these commands? And so now we're going we're gonna to be going back through them. Keep an eye on... Um, where are your strengths? Now, your strengths, remember, we're, we're, this whole thing is about community, dwelling together. So as you identify those areas where you're strong, those are areas where you can help the community. You can help and serve others. Where are your weaknesses? These are areas that you need to practice in community. You're not going to solve these on, their own, on your own because all of these are issues that must be solved in community. Sometimes we say, well, I'm too broken, I'm too this, and so I hold back from community. No. What you need is to bring your brokenness into community. That's where it will be worked on. Don't isolate. Don't hold back. Get involved. All right, so... I'm going to now quickly go back through those three slides and make a mental note. If you have pad and paper, write it down or take a note in your, in your phone. Uh, let's see, I'm going to have to scroll up, so I apologize for that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Authenticity. Are you in the habit of hiding or are you open, vulnerable? transparent? Are you willing to be real before other people? Hypocrisy. Do you pretend to be something that you're not? Purity. Do you honor your body as holy, belonging to God? And by the way, I'll just make a connection here. The scripture says that we belong to one another. So if we're in a habit of dishonoring our body, we're actually hel not helping and maybe hindering the community. If you know that you're holy, your body is holy, and you act holy and, and create an environment where others can also aspire to that holiness. I don't mean, I don't mean rigid uh, uh, religious spirit. It's, it's in humility. It's in humility that we... Uh, come together and we help each other to be all that God has called us to be. Actually care. Do you love with genuine affection or do you find yourself putting on a disingenuous happy face? Seek community. Not isolating to seek your own sense of security, comfort, or pleasure. Are you actively placing yourself in community even though that may be an inconvenience or may, may threaten your sense of security, right? Are we, are we purposely trying to step out into relationship? 
lift one another up, show honor. Are you speaking well of and to others, or are you critical, negative, complaining? Lay down your life. Are you living for God? Are you seeking your own will or God's will? Spiritual zeal, are you passionate about knowing and serving God, or are you just doing your duty as you understand it, going through the motions? Diligently serving others, are you discovering and using your spiritual gifts in the body of Christ? Perseverance, is your faith moving forward, or are you stuck? paralyzed in some area of your spiritual walk. Now, I just, wanna, I just want to um, make a comment here. You know, we left the baptistry up, and, and I want to just say, sometimes getting stuck can be a small thing. You know, like, for instance, the Bible says, Jesus says, be baptized for the remission of sins. And... and you know, the, we think, well, I, I don't really think that's, it's, it's not a matter of salvation, so I'm not going to do it. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to do it, you know. Um, and so we're, we're choosing to ignore Christ's command to get baptized, right? Um, or maybe, well, I, that would be a little embarrassing. I don't want to do this, you know, in front of people because would, that would be embarrassing, right? So we make these decisions, and something as simple as that can create a stuck place in your Christian walk where you're not able to progress deeper with God. God always blesses obedience. Generosity. Are you happily sharing or are you hoarding or spending what you have on your own pleasure? Hospitality. Now I want to make a comment about that. The, the ancient um, Near Eastern idea of hospitality wasn't just being hospitable to for your your friends and the people you know it, it often referred to a hospitality hospitality to strangers entertaining strangers and there's stories where a, a stranger w would come and they would say no no stay with me and 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 this this goes on today in um, in some of the countries that we do ministry in you know people who are living in poverty they're so thrilled that you would come to their, their um, town or whatever, and so they, they want to just have you come into their house. You, it, it's a blessing to them to come into to their house. And so while they are so poor, they wouldn't dare, right, spend money that they can't afford to feed themselves, but because you're there, they'll go out and kill one of their, their chickens or a goat or something and, and cook it, even though they can't afford it, but they, they want to show you hospitality, right? That's the idea. And so, do you welcome strangers or are you overly protective? Bless, blessing. There is a tension that I mentioned earlier about exposing evil and wanting our enemies to be saved. We live in that tension. But we need to love even our, our enemies, our persecutors. Are you gracious or are you hostile and resentful? Paul wrote in Titus, Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling, be gentle, and show perfect courtesy toward all people, even on social media. Wait, no, I added that. Okay, so Chip describes these commands as God's answers for loneliness. Now, why would he say that? Because really, the common lot of humanity, ever since falling out of grace with God is that we all carry in our hearts a deep sense of loneliness, inability to really connect in, in a meaningful way. And so to some level, we all wear masks and, and you know, we try to put a good face on and we do these things. And, but God 
is all about pulling down the masks and restoring intimacy, which means vulnerability, ability to be real and true with each other, to accept our faults and the faults of others, and to uh, motivate one another towards true intimacy. And so, um, true intimacy brings the supernatural love of God into our everyday relationships. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, right here. So, um, there's a, a very simple Bible study technique. You know, um, if, if you're a relatively new believer, you know, this might be helpful to you. Um, but it's, it's just a three-step process, and you can use this on any scriptures. It's as simple as observation, what does the scripture, what does the passage say? Interpretation, what does it mean? And then application, what does it mean for me? In other words, what is it calling, how is it calling me to respond in love and obedience to God? And so we look at this passage, observation, what does it say? Identify your strengths and your weaknesses. Here's these commands. Identify where, where are you strong, where are you weak, what do you need to work on in the community that God has provided for us to work on those things. Interpretation, what does it mean? Authentic community is to be deeply loved and to give love. The gospel addresses our deepest need to be love. Your needs and the needs of others get met as we serve one another in generous and selfless, sacrificial love. The focus is getting our eyes off of our problems and onto Christ, serving others with Christ-like love. Now, I, I'm not saying that means ignoring your problems. That's a problem, too, or avoiding responsibility. It's, it's having a right corporate mindset that sees our role within the community as to help each other. And so if you're not connected or you're not connected in the way you want or think you should be, ask for help. And then lastly, application. What does it mean for me? And Chip states it this way, the container of authentic community is a connected small group where you can be, feel safe and be real. Do you feel like you're spiritually stuck? Consider whether you are showing up authentically in relationship. Are you connected in authentic relationships where you feel safe and are free to grow and discover the real you? A small group can be any type of gathering where the, the goal is to get real with who you are, where your life is going, where your spiritual life is going, and how you're becoming the person God wants you to be. That should be central to, to every Christian small group. Where are we, who we are, where are we going, and how are we, come, we becoming the person God wants us to be. And by the way, I have been in small groups where that, that did not always feel safe and they did not always foster a freedom to be real. If you can't find one, create one. You don't need to be a leader. You just need to be, have a desire to build authentic community with a few other people. And a small group isn't necessarily a Bible study, but a common pursuit of knowing God and being known by him and by others. Some of the most uh, healthy and spiritually nourishing small groups that I have been in were not Bible studies, small groups, or, or home groups. These are different names that churches use. It doesn't have to be a church-sponsored group. Some of the healthiest ones I've been in, we just began referring to ourselves as spiritual friends, but we had a common goal. Come together, 
to seek God, to learn to be real with ourselves, the good and the bad, and to pursue um, discovering who God is making us to be and to take that next step into that, our relationship with God. It always means moving out of our comfort zone and into the next step. That's the adventure that God has called us to. You're never going to grow as long as you stay in your comfort zone. If you don't have a regular practice of identifying what's the next step that you have to take in order to get yourself out of the comfort zone and to trust God, to risk in, in the context of relationships or, or um, you know, growing in, in activities or skills or, or, you know, what is God calling me to do? How is he calling me to serve, to minister, to, to step out and maybe make a fool of myself, right? If, if that is not a regular part of your thinking, you will remain stuck. So I want to ask you, think about that. Ask yourself every day, what is my next step that's going to get me out of my comfort zone? The point is to get connected in relationships with others who have the same goal of knowing God and creating a safe place for you to explore your life in God. And I'm going to just close with this. Just a reminder. You can either be in authentic community where you are learning to be deeply loved and to give love, or you can be this guy. For those who weren't here the last time I spoke, this is my, this is my son imitating his daddy. Now, this was, you know, he, my, that son is now 31 years old. You know, I, I hope I've changed a little bit, maybe not as much as I would like. Um, I want to close by just speaking or praying the prayer of Paul over each of you. Because love. Paul writes, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Lord, may it be to each one of us.